there's a question that I think is really good coming from the Patreon community here uh, from someone named Alex. And I think it goes really well with the video from your friend, uh, Lindsey Graham, Scott Ritter, because he was on Face the Nation recently. Uh, what did Trump do to get the weapon slowing? He created a loan system. They're sitting on 10 to $12 trillion of critical minerals in, in Ukraine. They could be the richest country in all of Europe. I don't want to give that money and those assets to Putin to share with China. If we help Ukraine now, they can become the best business partner we ever dreamed of. That 10 to $12 trillion of critical mineral assets could be yeah. used by Ukraine and the West not given to Putin and China. This is a very big deal how Ukraine ends. Mm -hmm. Let's help them win a war we can't afford to lose. Let's find a solution to this war. But they're sitting on a gold mine to give Putin 10 or 12 trillion dollars of critical minerals that yeah. he will share with uh, China is ridiculous. So there's what that's what Lindsey Graham had to say. The question, though, from Alex, it, I think provides a good contrast that you can provide insight into Scott. He said, when will Russia know that it has won the special military operation? And what are the specific objectives for Russian victory? Now, this question is a good one because according to Lindsey Graham, one of the specific objectives is to uh, essentially take Ukraine's wealth and of course, hand it to its best friend, China. But what's the reality, Scott? Well, I think we, first of all, need to reflect on the reality that uh, what Lindsey Graham says is reflective of an overarching uh, policy posture by the United States when it comes to Russia. Go back to uh, the early 1990s, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Russia that emerged from that. Um, it's one of the ugliest periods of Russian history, and I would say it's one of the uglier periods of American history, too, and indeed the history of the, of the collective West, because rather than extending a helping hand to Russia, we put our foot on Russia's throat, and we in, helped install a very weak, corrupt leader named Boris Yeltsin, whom we exploited. In fact, you know, all this talk about American, uh, about Russian interference in American elections that turned out to be false. In 1996, America got Boris Yeltsin reelected, and it was such an egregious affront that uh, Time Magazine even made it a cover, as best election money can buy. Uh, you know, so we, we stole an election in Russia, gave it to Boris Yeltsin for the purpose of keeping Russia politically weak, um, and to steal mineral resources from Russia, from the former Soviet Union. Um, but there was an, an over, overarching objective of breaking Russia up into its constituent parts. This is what the Chechen conflict was all about. It was a CIA-backed operation designed to promote uh, succession movements, to get the Muslims of the Russian Federation to rise up against. It wasn't just designed in Chechnya that... They were hoping that a successful Yanks to the rescue, there it is, um, that, that the successful um, uh, secession of, of Chechnya would lead to a similar uh, withdrawal from the Russian Federation by, uh, the, 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 by Tatarstan um, and maybe Bashkiria uh, and other Muslim um, uh, entities. Uh, and this would lead further to the breakup of Russia, the Far East breaking in, Siberia breaking away. Russia would become not a singular federation, but actually turn into a series of independent states uh, who are weak and could be easily controlled and dominate. This was the strategic thinking of the United States, which is why we're so mad at Vladimir Putin for not playing the game and for stepping in and building a strong Russia. Um, but, you know, so Lindsay is right when he reflects on this. But let's 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 talk about what he says about Putin. Apparently, Lindsay knows Putin very well uh, because he, he can speak on behalf of Putin and um, Xi Jinping. Um, Lindsay's wrong. And is this me just saying this? You know, he said, she said, guess who the she is? Not me. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to go there. I just don't like Lindsey Graham. That was a very crude thing for me to say. So I apologize. Um, but Lindsey Graham, I don't like him. He is implying that it was... Putin's strategic objective to strip these materials, uh, this, this material wealth away from Ukraine. We know that's a lie. Why do we know that's a lie? 
Well, there's this thing called the um, Istanbul communique. Uh, let, let's look at two of the, uh, let's look at some of the mineral wealth that he talks about. Uh, one of them is lithium. Now, I'm not the world's smartest person, but I, I do know that lithium um, is a, com a key component in the production of um, batteries, electric batteries that play an important role in, um, you know, creating um, electric cars, et cetera, in the future. And that uh, the nation that controls lithium production um, is going to have a be in the driver's seat when it comes to um, producing um, electric vehicles. Um, and China, you know, has sort of the corner on the market. And uh, I think you'd be foolish to say, well, let's let China get control of everything. Um, so I understand the intent there, but the, the Istanbul communique uh, was going to return. There's two places where these lithium fields exist in um, economically viable quantities. One is in Zaporizhia, uh, one of the um, oblasts or territories of the, the, of the new Russia that's been taken over by Russia. But Zaporizhia was going to be returned to the Ukrainians, returned to the Ukrainians. Now, if the Russians wanted to keep those mineral resources, Lindsey Graham said, why is Russia giving Zaporizhia with one of the largest uh, exploitable lithium fields in the region uh, back to Ukraine? It shows that Lindsey Graham's a liar. The second place is Don, uh, Donetsk and the Donbass. Uh, those fields are actually uh, more viable because I guess it's easier to extract the Lithuanium from, uh, from these fields. But again, the way that the Istanbul communique was structured is that Russia couldn't speak on behalf of an, an independent entity, uh, and the Donbass, Donetsk, and Lugansk had declared their independence from Ukraine through referendums that took place on the eve of the Russian initiation of the special military operation. So Russia said, look, it's, it's independent, but what we guarantee is that we will work with Ukraine and the international community to hold referenda on the future of the Donbass. Um, will it opt to return to Ukraine with its rights guaranteed? Will they opt to be independent um, or will they opt to join Russia? What Russia said is there's no foregone outcome here. We, um, we will you know, let the will of the people um, in accordance with the United Nations Charter um, you know, play out. Uh, but Russia, you know, that's not how you operate if your goal is to seize control of lithium fields and uh, transfer this to, to China. So Lindsey Graham is just making stuff up. He's literally manufacturing a case out of thin air. The facts don't back up what he says. Uh, it's not Putin's intention to, uh, to steal this material. Um, it, it's just stupidity on Lindsey Graham's problem. But then again, we're talking about Lindsey Graham and pretty much everything he says and does is stupid. Indeed, indeed. And and lastly, on this, maybe, Scott, if you could just talk about uh, not a lot has been spoken about in terms of the battlefield. If you could give a quick summary on the battlefield, because I feel like a lot of this escalation ladder climbing that NATO is doing and a lot of the commentary you hear coming out of the U.S. political class uh, does have an uh, kind of an air of, of desperation. But yet Bloomberg, I saw a report recently saying that, well, Russia's uh, so-called offensive that it's waging right now in Kharkov and other areas of the front line. Uh, time is coming up soon because uh, the billions of dollars of weapons that were promised to Ukraine from the United States are on their way. So uh, maybe a quick summary on the reality there. I'll just postulate this for your, your audience. Um, okay, let's say I'm Ukraine. And I've I've taken a couple bad blows. I'm, I'm bloodied, I'm, but I'm trying to slow down the battlefield to receive weapons, um, and then I'm going to use those weapons to alter the outcome on the battlefield. When I gather these weapons, um, is it better that I use them the way that I want to use them, based upon a plan that I've come up to achieve uh, the results, or as the weapons come in? Do I immediately send them to uh, battlefields on the front line that are picked by Russia, that Russia's determined this is where the fight's going to be? 
and therefore I lose control of these assets. They, they're taken out of my hands as they come in. They're gone. They're on the battlefield. Oh, I've lost control. Russia's controlling the battlefield. That's what's happening here. Russia is creating the circumstances in which it dictates um, how Ukraine is going to use these weapons that Bloomberg talks about. Ukraine's not going to be able to assemble them into some sort of strategic reserve where Ukraine is going to have to immediately send them to the battlefield based upon what Russia is doing. And what is Russia doing? Russia, again, Vladimir Putin talked about this. Uh, that's why I always encourage people uh, to attend the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. And if you can't, to at least monitor it and listen to what the Russian president has to say. But he, he said some interesting things, including um, that Russia could win this war very soon but it would require massive offensive operations that would uh, kill a lot of Russian soldiers. He said, we're not in the business of killing a lot of Russian soldiers. We don't, you know, that's not what we want to do. Uh, it's also interesting, just as a little tangent, uh, that uh, Putin hinted for the first time about uh, the level of Russia's casualties. And he speaks of what are known as irretrievable losses. Um, these are dead and wounded to the point that you can't be returned to the battlefield. Um, there's, if you threw out a number, say 500,000 irretrievable Ukrainian losses, some people, myself included, would say there's more than that. Others would say there's less. Let's just call that a happy middle ground, 500,000. Um, Russia said that it's one to five, that for every five, uh, Ukrainian irretrievable losses. There's one Russian irretrievable loss. That means 100,000 Russians have become irretrievable losses. Uh, this in a war that's just slightly over two years in, in length. The United States lost 58,000 men in Vietnam over the course of 10 years, and that broke our nation, broke our back. We lost the will to continue the fight. But the Russians are getting stronger. Um, if, they, if it took two years to have 100,000 irretrievable losses, understand that Russia is gaining uh, recruits at a rate of 50,000 a month in some cases, 30 to 50,000 a month are joining to be trained to come and fight in the special military operation. So even if the Russian losses are high, uh, and 100,000 is very high, um, the Russia's making up for it. Russia can continue fighting. What Putin is saying is we we don't want to. The modern war is bloody enough as it is. We don't want to um, do things on the battlefield that, that cause Russians to die. We prefer to cause the enemy to die. Um, and again, 500,000 is a lot of dead or irretrievably lost Ukrainians. So Russia's goal has been to advance where you can but where the Ukrainians decide they want to fight, then to push, stop, dig in, and then initiate the meat grinder operation, bring in the fab bombs, the, 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 the guided bombs with the wings that, you know, fly in and hit targets. The aircraft never have to reach the, uh, the, the forward edge of the battlefield. Um, artillery supremacy, missile supremacy, drone supremacy, and basically grind the Ukrainians down so that, You've now created um, what we've seen in, in, in the past, the Bakhmut effect, where the Ukrainians commit to a battle, and then in order to prevail in the battle, just keep pouring resources in until 90,000 troops later, they're out of resources. Or we can talk about the Avdiivka effect, another battle where the Ukrainians just kept pouring in resources until they ran out of resources. In both battles, Bakhmut and Avdiivka, once the Ukrainians ran out of resources, they had to retreat, and Russia advanced and took that territory and then continues to advance slowly. What's happening in Kharkov? Russia opened up a northern front. Uh, the purpose of this front ostensibly is to create a buffer zone. But the Russians advanced as far as they could um, without over- uh, committing the offensive and losing people. They advanced as, large, as far as they could, and now the Ukrainians have rushed reinforcements in, and they've frozen the lines. But that's to Russia's advantage, because now Russia is involved in meat grinder operations. And now we have a meat grinder taking place there. We have another meat grinder taking place 
uh, in Donetsk. We have another meat grinder taking place in Zaporizhia. And as these weapons come flowing in with whatever limited manpower Ukraine is able to mobilize, the meat grinder is consuming them based upon Russia's initiation initiative, not Ukraine's. And guess what? And now the Russians have opened up another front near Sumy. Um, now another meat grinder. There's talk about Russia opening up uh, you know, a front in Kherson. You have the Ukrainians actually evacuating Kherson now because um, they can't defend it. They don't have troops. Um, and so, you know, Russia could be going back there. The bottom line is Russia is going to build meat grinder operations all along the front. So Ukraine throws in its resources, grinds them up. And then when they're out of resources, Russia does what it does. It keeps advancing. This is inexorable. It can't be stopped. It's um, proof uh, positive that, you know, Russia is, um, is winning. And um, even with all this new NATO equipment and stuff, it's not enough. Basic military math shows that Russia is accumulating military power every day that this war goes on. Uh, they're, they're gaining more strength than is being lost on the battlefield by a significant number. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, are losing more strength on the battlefield than is being replenished, even with this NATO assistance. So no matter what, the disparity between the two forces is, 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 is the gap is just growing even larger in favor of uh, Russia. So that's what's going on. Um, I'll leave you with this thing. Um, you know, Putin has always been saying that um, the calendar doesn't drive this operation. That, um, you know, we're not talking about victory by this month or by this month or by this month. Victory happens when victory happens. Victory is defined by denazification, getting rid of all of the Banderist supporters in the Ukrainian government to include the Zelensky government and anybody affiliated with him. The Russians have sought to isolate Zelensky politically, both at home and abroad, by questioning the uh, constitutionality of his of his mandate. Um, but it's it's so they're 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 attacking Zelensky domestically, but they're also attacking Zelensky uh, abroad, uh, basically saying that you know this is a man who doesn't represent the Ukrainian people, that this is a dictatorship, etc. And the implication that Putin gave is that uh, he expects Zelensky to stay in power uh, through this year into next year, and that next year he believes that this problem will go away. But if you've built denazification around de, you know, removing Zelensky and his government, and you're saying it's going to take another year, I think Putin just told us something there, that He's in no rush to win this war. I know I've quoted uh, Russian generals who've told me, no, the battlefield's changing in May. It's going to be decisive. And then you're going to see even bigger map changes. But I think that they may have made those statements assuming that they were going to do big aero operations. And the Russian government has said, we, we don't have a mandate. We have a mandate to win. We don't have a mandate to win at any cost. And... Um, we're not going to do these big arrow operations, which now only 23% of the uh, Ukrainian energy infrastructure is up and running. And even if the war stopped today, they wouldn't be able to get uh, that infrastructure up and running by wintertime. One can definitely understand that in what's left of the summer season, that Russia is going to try and reduce that 23% to as close to zero as possible. Um, so that Ukraine is facing a disaster when wintertime comes. And if it's a harsh winter, um, uh, Ukraine may not survive as a nation. Um, and that's part of Russia's strategy. Remember, Putin said, I'm not in the business of killing Russian soldiers. Uh, we need to preserve as many Russian lives as possible. So we're going to do things that puts maximum pressure on Ukraine to willingly go to a table and say, yes, we're ready to surrender. Um, so that's my take on the on the battlefield. It's um, it's a bloody um, meat grinder operation where Russia is in control, uh, but Russia is not committed to any timeline. Russia is committed to accomplishment of objectives, and again, the you know the fact that the United States and Europe are pouring money into Ukraine, it uh, changes the game. It's a game changer. It doesn't mean Russia loses. Russia is not going to lose this war, but. The game has changed. New realities have come into play that Russia has to adapt to. 
And so I think Russia's strategy is a strategy of um, patience and perseverance. Um, just wait and let the situation develop in a way that's to the benefit, exclusive benefit of Russia. And in this case, that means that the Russians are killing far more Ukrainians than can be replaced. And the Russians are ensuring that whatever replacements they bring in exceeds the number of Russians that the Ukrainians are killing.